This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On June the 8th, the RCMI Museum held a speaker's evening with two distinguished Canadian historians of World War I, Dr. William Stewart on the Battle of the Somme and Dr. Tim Cook on the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Dr. Cook. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, that's a nice introduction, and thank you all for coming. Ryan took a bit of time today to show me the uh, exhibitions here, the artifacts, and it's just a stunning building. I know you know that, but uh, what a treat it is to talk about history in a building that has so much rich history. Um, my talk is going to be about the Battle of Vimy Ridge, but also about the memory of Vimy, and in fact, probably more about Vimy as an idea over time. I think back to a year ago when 25,000 Canadians went to Vimy Ridge. That was an astonishing thing to see, to be a part of. I was lucky to go there as, uh, with CBC as their historical commentator to talk to those young people. 12,000 high school students were there. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? I, I gave a number of talks across the country before, during, and after, and a lot of people said, the government's sending those kids, right? And I said, no, they're sending themselves. I mean, they paid for it. They did it through however kids do it, car washes, bottle drives, and whatever 21st century stuff kids do to raise money. The important thing is they wanted to go. They felt compelled to go. There was the royal presence there. The governor general was there. Prime Minister Trudeau was there. As part of Trudeau's speech, you will remember that he said, Vimy is the birth of our nation. It is a place where we were born. He wasn't the first to say that. He probably won't be the last to say that. But I was struck by that, and I was struck by that phrase, which has been associated with Vimy for a long time. And when I wrote my book, which came out March of 2017, so right before that event, it was like writing it up to the 99th year and the 11th month. I, how is this thing going to end? Luckily, they gave me an opportunity to, uh, to do an afterword and to bring it forward and to talk a little bit about the 100th and I think a little bit about the idea of Vimy over time. That phrase, I think, that Trudeau said, the birth of the nation, has been repeated by others before him, and I think it's a good starting place because I wonder what is meant by that. Were we actually born at Vimy? What happened? almost exactly 50 years before that. That was Confederation, right? Was that a false birth? Were we born twice? What's going on here? So there's something about the Vimy idea that I think is important to explore, but it's crucial, of course, to understand the battle itself, what happened. And I think Bill's fantastic talk on the Somme gave you quite a lot on operations and tactics and strategy. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but then I'm going to pivot into the evolution of the Vimy idea over time. This is a, one of my favorite paintings from the War Museum collection. Richard Jack's painting, The Battle of Vimy Ridge, captures the gunners who are so crucial in that battle. Um, it captures the ridge itself. You don't often see a lot of photographs of Vimy Ridge, right? Seven kilometers long in northern France. You can't actually capture it in a camera lens. Um, and so this painting, I think, um, is an important thing there. But before this battle, of course, the Canadians limped off the Somme, 24,000 casualties to the Canadians from September to November of 1916. They moved to the Arras front. They moved opposite Vimy Ridge, in effect, in the foreground of this painting here. It was a quiet sector at the time. The Germans were worn out, the Canadians were worn out, the Germans had fought the Battle of the Somme, and of course at Verdun, the longest running battle of the war from February of 1916 to November of 1916, where both the Germans and the French suffered 750,000 casualties. So everyone was worn out and exhausted, but almost immediately the Canadians began to raid the enemy. This was something that they had 
uh, re been renowned for, these raidings, these aggressive patrols across no man's land carried on for the three months before the battle, January, February, March. It helped the Canadians hone their battle tactics. It helped them take the lessons of the Somme learned in blood there and to apply them on the battlefield. And there was an act of learning that occurred after the Battle of the Somme. Bill did, um, showed all of the challenges of the Canadians, uh, officers, commanders, communications. A lot of those um, continued into 17 and into 1918 as well. But one of the key things was that the Canadians studied those lessons. Under command of Sir Julian Bing, the Corps commander, they actively looked at what had succeeded and what had failed on the Somme. And some of those lessons that Bill talked about, he has pulled from the lessons learned documents that the Canadians went through. It was a really agonizing period to talk about their own failure, to talk about how they had lost hundreds of their comrades, but still they did it, this learning exercise. The artillery went through a massive evolution during this period. Um, uh, Andrew McNaughton, a name you will recognize, Army commander in the next war, plays a key role in honing the counter-battery work. Bill talked about this. On the Somme, there was almost no, well, he said, no counter-battery work. Counter-battery work is trying to target the enemy gunners to suppress their fire, to destroy their fire. McNaughton, employing new scientific gunnery, took out those guns. Um, and it's a key part to the victory. There was a massive barrage a bombardment that went on uh, weeks before the war, hundreds of thousands of shells in the week before the war, um, as in combination with new infantry tactics. They had learned from the Somme the line tactics that had failed so often when their officers had been knocked out. Now they were trained in the months before Vimy on how to attack forward, how to move on the battlefield. They were issued maps, 40,000 maps drawn from aerial intelligence. Those maps sound like a simple thing. Of course we would want the privates to know where they're going. Well, that was a revolution. The devolution of command was important. Key logistical elements, the building and digging of those tunnels beneath Vimy. Some of you have probably been in Grange Tunnel, one of the large tunnels that is still there today. Um, all of this comes together, I think, along with, I think, the important ingredient, which is the lesson of the psalm. Those 24,000 casualties, the survivors of the psalm move forward with those, with that experience towards this battle. And nonetheless, some of the histories of Vimy portray it almost as a cakewalk. The idea of the creeping barrage, which had been used on the Somme, but that Vimy was largely perfected with that um, screen of artillery fire moving up the ridge, or in some places down the ridge, if you're on the 1st Division's front, um, which the infantry moved behind, leapfrogging forward as they pushed forward on that day. <coughs> but it's not that simple. If you read the letters, if you read the diaries of the soldiers who were there, it was a near-run thing. This was a bloodbath. Those young guys, I've read their letters. The most powerful ones for me are the letters that they write the night before the battle, the 8th of April, the morning of the 9th of April, writing to their mothers, writing to their fathers, writing to their children. They know that in a few hours they will be possibly killed or maimed. You cannot read them without a tear coming to your eye. The battle itself was... A brutal affair, it went off at 5.30 in the morning. The Canadians fought throughout much of the day. This is a photograph we know from the 2nd Division front. Why? Because it has tanks in it. There were nine tanks issued to the Canadians, all on the 2nd Division front in the bottom of the sector. I think the important thing to remember about Vimy is just how close it was. The Germans had the heights of Vimy. If you have been to Vimy, you can see the commanding heights there. You can see that the Germans could look down and plunge artillery fire and mortar fire, mortar fire into the Canadian positions. And despite the creeping barrage and despite the training, it took tremendous acts of courage and of bravery to take that ridge, which the Canadians did by the morning of the 10th, and they solidified it on the 12th. But of course, the battle doesn't end there. And we don't remember the battle, I think, 
as just a battle. It is something much more. And one of the interesting things about the 100th anniversary last year is how little the battle was discussed. The actual tactics, the command control elements, the combined arms warfare came much more down to individuals or the strange pageantry and dancing around and all those elements that were a part of that. Nonetheless, I think the battle is important to know. And it's a key ingredient in understanding what I call the legend of Vimy Ridge, this idea that has developed over a hundred years. Another key element to the legend, the ingredient is the casualties, is the cost of Vimy Ridge. 10,602 casualties in four days. Today's equivalent were about five times as large, about 8 million at the time, we're about 35 million today, a little over that. So today's equivalent would be 52,000 Canadians killed or wounded in a four day period. We paid for Vimy with blood. Imagine the grief, imagine the cost. Imagine those families across this country and the death telegrams that were arriving in the weeks that followed this battle. Another key ingredient, I think, in the Vimy story is that it is largely a story of success. It's success in a sea of failure. The Canadians fight as part of the British forces. Bill's talk makes that very clear. The Canadians never fight alone in the First World War. As part of the Somme, we're always fighting as part of, in that case, Goff's uh, Reserve Army, I think it's called at the time, Fifth Army later. Um, we fight as part of First Army at Vimy. And of course, Third Army is fighting to the south. And the British Battle of Arras is part of a larger French offensive. So this is a massive assault. And the British, for the most part, have equal amount of success on the 9th of April as the Canadians. They push just as far, and in some cases, two divisions push farther. But on the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, the attack breaks down, the mud clogs up the logistics, and then the Germans begin to counterattack. The French, however, further to the south, it's an absolute disaster. They attack a week later, they have atrocious intelligence, their commander is, um, um, doesn't really know what he's doing, I think, and they suffer 130,000 casualties in two weeks. By early June, one-fourth of the French army is in mutiny. I mean, this is a serious bloodletting. And so within this sea of largely defeat, the Canadians have succeeded. That's important. We're a young country. We need victories like this. These are the stuff that feed into the mythology that all nations use to create their own legends and their own stories. There was wild celebration. Our Prime Minister of the day, Sir Robert Borden, looking very stately there on the right. He was in London at the time. He receives massive celebrations and congratulations. Everyone is talking about the Canadian victory because everybody knew about the ridge itself. The ridge had been fought over back and forth by the French, by the Germans for two and a half years. They had suffered 400,000 casualties, the French and the, and the Germans, on this ridge. When the Canadians arrived there in late October, early November, and, and when the 4th Division comes later, they talked about the stench of the unburied bodies, thousands of rotting corpses from previous battles. That, I suppose, must have sobered the Canadians considerably for the task that faced them. The key thing here is that the ridge itself is a key geographical feature, and capturing it was easily identifiable. And you see a very rare photograph there that I found in our holdings. It was unidentified, um, at least in the catalog, but that's Vimy Ridge, and it gives a really rare shot, I think, of the ridge. And so those are some of the key ingredients that come together, along with, as Bill mentioned, the fact that the Canadian Corps attacked together for the first time at Vimy Ridge, and the only time all four divisions will attack together. And that's important for later in the story. It's interesting, if you look at the newspaper correspondence around this, there isn't a lot of attention paid to the fact that all four Canadian divisions fight together. That will become an idea that takes on importance later on. And it's important because English Canadians are there, and French Canadians, and new Canadians, and indigenous Canadians. And there is a representation of Canada at this battle. Vimy immediately becomes a site of remembrance. Um, it's a point of pride and of hubris. It is um, a place where we bury our dead and we mark our dead. But Vimy was not a strategic victory. 
Vimy does not end the war. The war does not end on the 12th of April, 1917. That's not Remembrance Day, right? It will go on for another 19 months minus a day. And so why Vimy? That's the question. Why Vimy and not the Somme? Or Montsorel? Or Second Ypres? Or the Battles of the Hundred Days, which arguably are the most important battles that the Canadians fight in. This painting here by Eric Kennington called The Conquerors captures a 16th Battalion marching forward over the bones of German soldiers. What's interesting about it is he paints the living and the dead together. The pale-faced soldiers are the dead. They march with their comrades. The Hundred Days Battles, the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August, 1918, followed by the Second Battle of Arras in late August, followed by the attack to capture Combray, an absolutely essential logistical position at the end of September, finally captured on the 9th of October. The assault on Valenciennes, an artillery battle that Ryan knows very well and is writing about. And finally, the capture of Mons. Those are the battles that encompass the Hundred Days. They are, for the most part, I would suggest, unknown to Canadians. So what is it about Vimy that will draw 25,000 Canadians to the ridge? What are the ingredients? There's much more to the First World War, of course, than just the battles, the Hundred Days, Vimy, the Somme. It is the home front, and historians, of course, have broadened their analysis into examining how Canada engaged in an almost total war on the home front and was torn apart at the same time over the conscription crisis. That, too, is a part of our story. The war left deep scars. And when it ended on November 11th, 1918, at least on the Western Front, it ended with a whimper and not a bang. The world in Canada had been forever changed. And I really like this cartoon. You see a, a British portly soldier, I suppose, looking at a sign of Canada, the empire's greatest what? No, colony scratched out, dominion scratched out, nation. All right, something has happened. Canada is changed. We are a country that has been born or changed in war. The war unified Canadians like never before while also tearing the country apart. That's important, I think. For 50 years, we had slowly grown, changed, moved through our stumbling baby steps, increasingly more sure of ourselves. But the war was a traumatic event. The cataclysm was seen by millions of English Canadians with their strong links to the British Empire as an existential threat. To understand the Canadian war effort is to understand that. That Canadians of the day, British Canadians, English Canadians, for the most part, saw this as an existential threat. This was a war that could not be lost. It had to be won no matter the cost. Why we have such rupture in our country is that not all Canadians agreed with that. Even French Canadians who are often painted in a broad brush of not supporting the war, for the most part supported the war. They just didn't see it to the point of conscripting young men for overseas service. They didn't see the need for the crusade for a European war. That's the key difference. Whatever we want to say about the First World War, and I will say a bit more and I look forward to your comments later, we emerged battered but proud. There was no going back to the old ways. We were well on our way to nationhood. Now the wartime debt of 66,000 was a deep scar on the country. I think after the armistice, there was a coming to grips with these losses these mothers who buried their sons. How would they view it? How would it be framed? After the propaganda died down, after the politicians stopped talking about the need to dig deep, the clergy, the business folk, how would the, view, the war be viewed? Would it be seen as a senseless slaughter? Would we blame our leaders? We didn't do that. What we did is we turned around and we made meaning of the sacrifice. We called it a necessary war for civilization. And I think the John McRae poem is an interesting example of how that memory changes. This poem, of course, we've all memorized it over time. If I started here, I imagine we could all finish it in this room. It was written and published in December of 1915. Of course, it's a martial poem. It's about keeping up the fight against the Germans. To you, from failing hands, we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. It's about keeping up the fight. 
after the war, though, that torch becomes a torch of remembrance. It fits within the larger realm of the need to remember this war, the need to sanctify the dead. It's an important symbol, and one of the reasons why its popularity has endured for a hundred years. My kids are 13, 11, and 9. All three of them have memorized, two of them have memorized <coughs> the poem, and I imagine the third will get it soon. We began to make meaning of the war. We commemorated it. We named buildings and streets after the fallen, after commanders, after battles. There were medals and official death notices. There's a silver cross, three silver crosses I was noticing in this case right here. More than 60,000 were issued to the mothers of the fallen soldiers during the war. Communities built parks and gardens. They planted trees. There were plaques. There were commemorative histories. There were stained glass windows in churches. There were family memories. There were shrines. There were photographs. There were archival letters, all treasured. All an example of a son or a father or a brother or an uncle who had gone off to war and in this case, not returned. There's a remarkable diversity and breadth, I think, to marking the war. And many of these monuments are still hiding, still here, hiding in plain sight. They're throughout our cities, every town, every village, wherever you grew up, I will almost guarantee you there is a monument there to the First World War. And of course, the Second World War names were added to most of those monuments after that war. And these local monuments, more than 4,000 of them built across this country, became places of remembrance, places of gathering for Armistice Day and then later Remembrance Day, two important symbols that come out of the First World War, the poppy, two minutes of silence. These local memorials became powerful places of gathering and of anchoring communities to the war. And they remained so for decades on end. Now there were also, of course, national memorials. The Peace Tower in Ottawa, when the Parliament buildings burned down in 1916, when they were rebuilt, the Peace Tower is a monument and a memorial. The National Memorial on the right, where we have our national um, uh, commemorations to this day on Remembrance Day, um, unveiled in May of 1939, ironically only months before we went to war again. These were part of the national monuments, but there was also a desire to mark the overseas battlefields. And if you have traveled to those battlefields of the Somme or Second Deep or Amiens or Canal du Nord or Vimy, of course, there are eight sites that the government decided to mark. Sir Arthur Curry, the last Corps commander, chose those sites and they would become uh, important markers. Some have been ignored. Hill 70, interestingly, was not given one of these markers and there has been a group over the last five years that has raised money to build a new monument there. Now the guidelines for this are very interesting. These eight sites that were selected, and I talk about this in my book. I had to untangle this because it wasn't clear, but the competition that begins in 1920 said that if there was a superior design, they might build that design in all eight sites. Or if it was really unique, they would choose one of the sites. So they weren't sure. They did this competition, they had 160 submissions, and they did a short list of 17 of them. And here's a rare photograph. These were the 17 finalists. And you can see that there is a similarity to many of these. They seem to be a single tower. If you look really closely on the far right, you'll see the brooding soldier was the second choice, which is now erected at to mark the Second Battle of Ypres in April 1915. And in the far back is Allward's maquette. And here's a close-up of it. Walter Allward was a uh, Toronto architect. He was known to Canadians before. He had erected a monument to the Northwest Rebellion and to the South African War Monument, which is 300 meters away from here, of which I imagine 20,000 cars pass every day, and I'm sure many of them do not notice what they're looking at. So he was known in that way that uh, sculptors are known, which is to say that he probably wasn't known at all. But this was his submission, and um, it's quite remarkable. The twin pylons, the uh, allegorical figures who are on there, and the stone wall, flat wall on the front, which he saw as his most important part to the monument. Interesting. He saw this as, as um, this would face uh, whatever field it was and this idea that the Canadians had captured this ground and held it for all time. 
What's remarkable about this, and here's Walt, uh, Walter Allward here in his South African War Monument, is I found his contract at the National Archives. And it says, you are to go overseas, this is 1922, and build your monument at Hill 60, which is in the Ypres Salient, which is to mark the Battle of Montsorel. Now that's really interesting, right? Uh, most of us have never heard of the Battle of Montsorel until Bill informed us of it in June of 1916. From the 2nd of June to the 13th of June, a three-phase battle where the Canadians are soundly defeated in the first two phases and finally recaptured lost ground on the 13th. It is uh, one of the least known battles, even though there are more than 8,000 Canadian casualties at it. Nonetheless, what's interesting about this, I think, is that our monument, our national monument, is not going to be built at Vimy. So what does that tell us? Well, I think in 1922 it tells us that it's not the birth of the nation, Vimy. We're not even going to build our monument there. The book talks a little bit about how we switched it. It was actually William Lyme Mackenzie King, newly uh, new Prime Minister of Canada at that point, an interesting figure in our history. We all know Mackenzie King. We know him for talking to his dead dog and his dead grandmother and seeing signs everywhere. Uh, he's also our longest serving Prime Minister, and he was a uh, politically uh, adept operator. I've written a book about him, and it was fun getting to know Mackenzie King uh, with all his warts and other things. But he's important in moving Vimy, uh, moving the monument to Vimy. And that's where Walter Allward begins working in 1922. It's really interesting. The government of Canada says the monument uh, was built from 1925 to 1936. I don't know where they get that date from. It's not right. He actually begins working in 1922, which is, means it's almost a 15-year project for Walter Allward. That's his life's work. He was overseas. And I won't talk here, as I'm, I'm running short or running on time, except that it is a saga. And I talk about this in the book of how he went to search for the stone. And if you've been to Vimy, who here has been to Vimy? Many of you have been to Vimy. You know the stone there. Um, creamy limestone. He spent years looking for that. He eventually finds it in a Croatian quarry. They transport it halfway across Europe. It's an amazing story of how they do so. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars. And his twin pylons, both, as he called them, pylons, both reaching for the sky. In 1927, I think it is, the French government gets a little worried as to what he's building on this huge ridge. And they say to him, can you tell us about it? We, we, we hear that there's two pylons with people crawling all over them, his, his allegorical figures. And he writes about the importance of these two pylons. He says these represent France and Canada coming together in the war. And the French think, ah, very good, yes. <laughs> of course, I wonder what his answer was if it had been built at Hill 60, right? It's Belgium and Canada coming together. <laughs> this takes 15 years. And uh, what I found interesting about this, of course, was that it, um, there was very little outcry in Canada. Where is our monument? I wrote a book called Clear's Warriors, which looked at the writing of Canadian military history. The veterans are apoplectic in the 1920s because they do not have an official history. And the Americans, they claim, keep stealing our thunder. We need an official history. It's supposed to be an eight-volume history written. One volume comes out in 1938. We never get anything else. Um, so that's a great failing. I think it took Canadians a long time to figure out how to do this commemorative aspect at the national level. The local level, they figure very early on. Those local monuments are largely built in the early 1920s. The national story takes longer to come together. The key event, though, is in 1936, when 6,000 pilgrims travel from Canada, most of them veterans with their families, you can see them here, the crowds of them, uh, coming together. This is 1936, right? One in six Canadians is out of work. Um, these are people who've saved their money. This is an important event. They hear about Walter Allward's monument in 1934. They hear that, it, that he's almost done. He missed it by two years. Almost done, and the Legion prepares this in the middle, and they're, this is the, before the day of faxes and uh, email, of course. They're doing everything by letters. It's an incredible operation. They're all military officers. They're all staff officers involved, so they know how to write orders and, and, and carry out things, but it really is an incredible thing. And these 6,000 pilgrims, they call themselves, come together, and they leave from the port of Montreal and they cross on five ocean liners. And this is absolutely crucial. 
the world turns its gaze towards the Vimy Monument. It's the largest single movement of Canadians in civilian times, I think, up until the 25,000 um, of last year. And they arrive at the Vimy Monument, and you can see an aerial shot here. They said there was 100,000 people there. Um, that's not true. In the book, I think I write about 50,000, and even that may be pressed because I was there last year, and 25,000 barely fit on that ridge. But they, they were all over the place, not the same level of security. What's really crucial about the Vimy unveiling is that King Edward VIII agrees to unveil the monument. And when he agrees to do this, it makes it an empire-wide event. It makes it a worldwide event. All of a sudden, the world is focused on the Canadians and Vimy Ridge. And it's absolutely crucial to understanding the massive coverage that happens here. Fascinating stories here about the speeches. I won't go into all the details. There's one interesting one, I think, that CBC, the precursor to CBC. CBC won't be established for a couple months um, before, uh, after this, but the precursor to that does a live broadcast, 95 minutes from, from Vimy. It doesn't survive, or at least it doesn't survive in any Canadian archives. And the Canadians, they're using BBC lines and wires, and the BBC say, we'll take care of it for you. And the Canadians say, no bloody way. We're going to have a Canadian, not someone with a British accent, and he's going to speak French. It's bilingual. It's quite interesting. So you see that something is happening here, this key event. The speeches themselves are powerful. I'll just choose one because I think it's important. Ernest Lapointe, the Minister of Justice, spoke Mackenzie King's word. Mackenzie King didn't go to this event. He wasn't liked by veterans and he didn't feel comfortable there. But these were his words. At Vimy, their hour of testing, the souls of Canadians revealed themselves gloriously at the summit of their national ascendancy. Now that's not the birth of the nation, but it's something similar, I think. A true Canadian nation, a new nation, a soul is revealed here. Now the pilgrims came back and they spread word of this in this in the RCMI. I think um, there is a pilgrimage medal here on display, second floor, third floor. Third floor, you should take a look at it, it's quite remarkable. We have the King's Golden um, Pilgrimage Medal at the War Museum. Um, they gave speeches. There were commemorative books. There was even a film about the pilgrimage. It propels the Vimy idea forward. Vimy was where Canada won its greatest victory and where the country had been changed. And if one needed proof, one simply had to look to Canada's King and the stunning monument. And we begin to see the monument and the battle bleeding together. It's a national monument which is put on the site of a four-day battle. And those ideas begin to come together, I think. And we can see that from this point going forward. There were plans for Canadians to go back in 1937 and 38. Of course, Europe is spiraling towards war at that point. We will go to war on the 10th of September, 1939, again at Britain's side. But this time, we decide to go to war. There is, of course, the war of little action, assuming you don't live in Poland, and then, of course, the Blitzkrieg of May 1940. And Canadians wake up in early June of 1940, after France is on the verge of falling, to this, these amazing photographs of Adolf Hitler at the Vimy Memorial. It's remarkable. He visited it, as I write in the book, as a First World War soldier, he had been stationed. His unit was on Vimy Ridge. About six weeks before the battle, his unit is moved about 20 kilometers north. What would have happened if his unit had not been moved north? Interesting what if of history. Nonetheless, Hitler is here. Canadians are told uh, and reported on in newspapers across the country that the Vimy Monument has been blown up. Poor Walter Allward in tears is interviewed at one point. He calls the, the Nazis monsters. How could they blow up the monument? And, of course, the subtext there is the monument that he had worked 15 years on and devoted his life to. Vimy becomes a rallying cry for Canadians during the Second World War. Just a couple of the many examples of how Vimy is incorporated within the war effort. I, I love the, the cartoon on the left here, What Price Victory. It's hard to read here, but they talk about how a new generation of Canadians will have to climb that ridge to recapture our ridge, to retake our monument and to protect it from the Nazi jackboot. The image on the right is interesting too as it combines John McRae, his poem with the monument and the torch. 
although poor John McRae's name is misspelled as it usually is on these things, but <laughs> I'm sure he would forgive. Um, it was liberated in September of 1944 by British troops. And there's an interesting story that I talk about in the book of Monty, Field Marshal Monty, of course. I do not have to name him and talk about him, except, of course, he was described by at least one other soldier as an efficient little shit. But he was much loved by the Canadians and by the British troops, and he flies straight to Vimy. He wants to be photographed there. Monty knew about how to do publicity. And he goes there, and they take some pictures of him. At the same time, Harry Criar, first Canadian Army commander, hears about the liberation, and he flies there. So the two generals arrive, Criar a little bit after Monty. Monty is walking away, and he hands the film to a Canadian press officer and says, why don't you publish this in the Maple Leaf? And Criar, one of his officers, sees it and literally goes over and steals the film. <laughs> And they take pictures of Criar there, and it's Criar's pictures that are published throughout Canada in early September 1944. It is an indication, I think, of the power of Vimy as a symbol. Um, I read the letters and diaries. I wrote a two-volume history of Canada in the Second World War, reading the soldiers' letters, the guys who visit this, September, October, November, seeing the names of their fathers, of their uncles, of their older brothers. This was a powerful place. They all talk about it, feeling the ghost and the weight of this site of memory. And the war ends, and it looks like, at least to me as a researcher, as someone who was writing about Vimy, that the Vimy idea would keep going, right? This idea that um, we choose Vimy for our national monument, we unveil it in 1936, it's this key event, it is overrun in 1940, it's liberated in 1944, it looks like Vimy's gonna become one of these crucial symbols for our country, except that almost everyone forgets about Vimy after the war. And why is that? Well, of course, we had fought in the Second World War, almost 45,000 dead. We had punched far above our weight again, at sea, on land, in the air. There were a new generation of veterans, almost a million veterans. And the First World War rapidly fades from memory for Canadians. But what's important, I think, is that Vimy, the monument, remains. It remains as a anchor on that ridge. It remains waiting for Canadians to return to it. Throughout the 50s, there are interesting reports from the groundkeepers at Vimy. They're talking about Vimy. Why aren't there more Canadians here? All we do is see French couples making out. They spend most of their time chasing them off. Canadians didn't go to the ridge. And in fact, the First World War largely began uh, to significantly fade beyond I think the 1956 Suez Crisis, Lester B. Pearson, we know the story of Suez, we know the intervention of Pearson in that uh, really dangerous period where France and Britain and Israel had invaded uh, Egypt and somehow managed to alienate both the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, that takes a lot of work. Uh, and I think it's Canada's finest moment on the world stage. And of course, Pearson is recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1957. And while there are some Canadians who felt that he knifed Britain in the back by not standing by them, we grow very quickly to like the idea of being a peacekeeping nation. It becomes more important in the 1960s, I would argue, as Canada is flexing its muscles, a country at 100 years. These anniversaries matter, 50th anniversary, 100th. 150th, we just passed through that, a very strange event, I would suggest, because we as a country are in a very strange place in how we treat our history. The 1960s become a period, a new focus on bilingualism, a new honor system, a new national anthem. The idea of peacekeeping becomes, comes to the fore. And of course, the new flag. It's a decade, uh, increasingly, at least from the mid-decade, of stronger anti-Americanism and certainly anti-war with the war in Vietnam. And Vimy looks like it will continue to fade away. An old symbol for an old country, no longer useful, no longer resonating in the new Canada. Except, of course, that anniversaries matter. And in 1964, the 50th anniversary of the First World War, the start of the war, we see a resurgence of the study of the First World War. New novels, new plays, the poetry of Sassoon and Owen are more uh, better read in the 1960s than they ever were in the 1920s. 
a lot of this comes from Britain, and of course a lot of it is anti-war, a lot of it condemns the generals for being the fools um, that many wanted to believe that they were, as opposed, I think, to what Bill would argue of the difficult battlefield conditions that they faced. In Canada, though, it's very different. In Canada, you look at the histories of the time, and Canada at the 100th anniversary of our country, combined with the 50th anniversary of the battle, Vimy becomes the signpost. And a lot of the histories of the time say, if there's one event that defines the country, it is Vimy Ridge. We see that in the histories. It's fascinating. Vimy, I would argue, is reborn again in 1967, from that low period after the Second World War in the 1950s, and it comes back in 67. And there's something about the monument and the battle. They become intertwined. They're linked, this four-day battle with this national monument. The old ideas of Canada taking the impregnable ridge while others failed, and that it was done by Canadians from across the country, are crucial to this messaging. It's a battle in a figurative way, I think, that all Canadians take part in. It is a martial symbol, but it is one that is cut by sorrow <coughs> and grief. And the legend of Vimy, I think, was able to straddle and to feed into, and to emerge to represent seemingly contradictory ideas of grief and mourning, and the loss is here, but also victory and unity. And that is the power of the Vimy story. It takes an old idea and repurposes it for a new country emerging forward. Now, it's not an idea that has been accepted by all. There, this is a room, I think, that is attuned to military history. There are many Canadians who have never heard of Vimy. There are many Canadians who say Vimy doesn't represent anything for me. In French Canada, Vimy doesn't really exist. And in fact, the First World War is seen as something quite different through the lens of conscription. Nonetheless, Vimy becomes an important martial symbol. And it's at Vimy in 1967 when we hear the first time that Vimy is the birth of the nation. And who gives voice to that? It is a soldier from the First World War who is now the Prime Minister of Canada, Lester B. Pearson. And he said of Vimy, it was the birth of a nation. And it is appropriate that as we celebrate the centennial anniversary of the creation of our country, we should recognize the one event which above all others made it a nation half a century later. Now, that's the same time where Brigadier Ross gave his famous talk of Vimy being the birth of the nation. And I think these are the stories that are told by countries. This is not a conspiracy. This is not a trap. This is about using war as a symbol to define the country. And we often don't think of that as something that Canadians do. And I think if someone was to ask me, what defines Canada, Tim? I would say it's probably the Charter of Rights and Freedom, it's multiculturalism, it's bilingualism, it's somehow learning to get along even though we don't like each other much. It's all these things, Tim Hortons and hockey. <laughs> but if you're looking for a martial symbol, and we are a country that fought six wars in the 20th century. We're a country that fought for 11 years in Afghanistan and training missions and all that. We're a country that is an independent country from the wars we fought and the wars we defended against in the 19th century and in the 18th century. I think it is fine to be proud of our country as a peacekeeping nation. We're also a country that has been shaped by war. And it's the Vimy story. It's the Vimy symbol that acts as that important martial element for our story. And it's one that from 1967, I argue, has become more and more important, has been incorporated within the school books and the texts, Pierre Burton's book, The Stone Carvers, key films that come out in 1997, the key event of 2007 when we returned to Vimy in far fewer numbers, and we talked about Vimy of being the birth of the nation, and then last year. And I think in closing up here, I will finish and say, Vimy is not the birth of the nation. We've had many births 
over our 150 years. But it's a key part of our story. It's a story, moreover, that we have chosen. I don't care if the British don't know about Vimy Ridge. I don't care if the Germans don't know about it. We chose Vimy to represent something for our country. And we do that because of the ridge, because of the battle, and because of the monument, all of which are there, all of which we use over time to tell the stories of who we are, who we were, and who we might be in the future. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, we're going to take questions again. Uh, if you want to direct them to Tim, just uh, please just speak up if you're close to the back. Thanks. Yes, sir. Can you explain why the creeping barrage is an effective tactic? Because I, I see two problems. First of all, the exploding shell will send shrapnel back towards your own guys. And even if you can deal with that, can't the Germans who are out of range still shoot through the, through the shrapnel? Right. And what, what protection does it provide? That's a good question. So when we think of a creeping barrage, I think we might think of a barrage that's 20 or 30 feet deep. At Vimy, it's 800 yards deep. So it's really a steamroller that's rolling over the enemy lines. The Canadian infantry following behind it have to be about 75 to 100 meters behind it. And even then, they're getting all kinds of friendly casualties. And that is one of the stories of the First World War. Uh, Bill mentioned it, but it's in every battle. Canadians are being killed by the, the shells being fired by British or Canadian gunners. Um, how the barrage is effective is it's generally a shrapnel barrage. And so the shrapnel is supposed to explode the shells at 18 to 20 feet, ideally, and they spray forward the hundreds of ball bearings and fragments. And so it's like a, an enormous um, uh, shotgun blast that continually sprays the line. Um, Germans can fire through it, for sure. Um, but what happens is that most of them tend to go to ground. They tend to go into the dugouts. And later in the war, um, Bill can attest to, the Canadians begin all kinds of creeping barrages that go sideways, backwards, moving forwards. There's one called a monkey puzzle barrage, I think, in Arras, where it's backwards, forwards. The Germans have no idea. And what the key thing is not to kill Germans, although it does kill Germans. The key thing is to keep them in their dugouts. So the case is not like the Somme, where the barrage comes down and stops, and the guys get up and they move forward, and that's when the Germans pop up. So it's a complicated system. It's, it's the most effective element, I think, in the combined arms warfare, but the key there is combined arms warfare. You need armored cars, you need tanks, you need air power, and most importantly, you need the infantry. Uh, barrage is important, and, um, and punishing bombardment fire and counter battery work, they're all crucial, but it still boots on the ground. Yes, sir. Uh, in the winter between uh, the Somme and Vimy, uh, uh, Bing sends Curry down to the French down at Verdun to learn French battle tactics. And uh, yes, they're assessing what went right and what went wrong in the Canadian side of it. What did they bring back from the French? that they incorporated into Canadian and British yeah. battle tactics. So both Curry and McNaughton go. And Curry is going as First Division Commander, and he, of course, will become Corps Commander in June of 1917. But he goes, largely, he's exposed to two main ideas. Three, actually, I, I think. One is, don't get your infantry to dig all your trenches and then expect them to fight a battle. And Bill talked about this, right, on the Somme, where they march out two days, they have half a day rest, and they march back two days and they fight a battle. That's wrong. So you need to have different labor units with the infantry doing the fighting, or at least those guys who are about to go into battle, they need to be pulled out and, and to train and to rest. So that's crucial. He also learns about the French um, infantry tactics, which on the, on, at Verdun, the French realize they have to decentralize. You've got to empower the junior officers, the NCOs, the corporals, the lance corporals, even the privates, to fight their way, way forward. Because their officers are going to get knocked out. 75% casualty rate at the Somme, just a little bit less at Vimy. Um, that's a key thing. The other thing that Curry learns um, is about artillery. And he learns that the French aren't doing it very well. 
And so that's a positive lesson. And McNaughton also is horrified by what the French are doing. McNaughton's main lesson to come back is we got to do more counter-battery work. So you're exactly, you're right. They send off on this learning mission. The key thing I would say there is that the British are there too. I mean, Curry and McNaughton are not trapsing around on their own. They're with a whole bunch of British staff officers. The British learn these lessons too, or at least they take the lessons back. The key is implementing them. And the advantage the Canadians have, I would argue, is the Canadian Corps, four divisions strong. The guys at this point know each other. They've fought together, those who have survived. The lessons can be shared more easily within the Canadian Corps itself. And that core structure, I think, is absolutely crucial. How important do you think is the, the fact that Canadian soldiers are not uh, repatriated, that the dead are not repatriated back to Canada? So you have these 66,000, the vast majority are populated in the cemeteries and ossuaries in France and Belgium. I think it's crucial, the fact that we leave our dead overseas. Now, early in the war, some of the dead in England come back, some airmen come back. There's a number of cases, two at least celebrated cases of mothers who go over in the 1920s to dig up their sons and to bring them back. But for the most part, we leave our dead overseas. And so they are there, and we have to return to them. And Vimy is important because I think partially the names of the 11,285 Canadians on there, those engraved names, they are the Canadians who die on French soil who have no known graves. Another 7,000 are marked on the Menin Gate. They die on Belgian soil. So over 18,000 Canadians with no known graves. That's one of the powerful elements of the Vimy Monument, the Menin Gate story, uh, and of course those cemeteries. And I have walked them. I imagine some of you have walked them. I remember coming across Piper Richardson's grave, 18 years old, lying there. And I was struck because I was 17 years old when I first visited the Western Front. I didn't know the Richardson story, but I went back and I read about it, and it has always struck me, and I've gone back to Piper Richardson's grave every time I've returned to the Western Front. Yes? You showed the uh, Germans visiting <coughs> the, uh, the monument in World War II. Why did they spare it? It's a good question. There is a rumor that going around that Hitler admired it so much that he didn't blow it up. That's not true. Um, although Hitler did have tremendous admiration for a number of the monuments from the First World War, because he was a First World War soldier. He had fought there. Um, but he didn't put out any special order to spare Vimy. He just said Vimy, luckily, is on um, the ridge, and the fighting in 1940 largely uh, went past it very quickly. And in uh, September of 1944, it was captured so quickly, so it wasn't destroyed. But the Germans had set up a number of 88 batteries around the Vimy Monument in August and September of 44. So they were going to use it as a defensive position. It was mildly damaged during the course of the war. Um, having said that, to finish my thought, Hitler did blow up a number of French monuments, but they tended to be monuments that glorified the French victory over the Germans in the First World War. He found that offensive. Vimy, of course, is a monument of grief and of loss. And I think um, that's one of the key things that, that drew um, Hitler to it. Yes? You mentioned there might be maybe 4,000 monuments across Canada. Right. I just wanted to tell you about one. Please. Canada in the First World War that's right, eight. A very small country. The impact of the war, because there must have been 10 percent of the country at the front, that's an enormous part of the community. There's a little place called Rennick. Rennick is west of St. Mary's, Ontario. There isn't even four buildings at the crossroads. It's just countryside. And yet there's a full monument, bronze statue, soldier. Those farmers at that moment, yeah. oh my, that must have been the impact across the country. And that's why I think Vimic in its way became the major symbol. Yeah. I think you're right, and it's something I argue in the book, and uh, Feel free to purchase it at the back. Um, but I think you're right. Those local monuments are absolutely crucial. And they're put up by the people. They're not federally funded. They raise the money. 
among themselves. And in small farming communities, you know that that hurt. Everywhere I go across the country, I visit monuments. I'm sure some of you do that as well. I'm astonished. A little town, and there's 14 names there. And I think there was probably only 30 houses here. Like, this is a town that was gutted by the war. And I think that's part of the story to get at. And Neil, um, behind you there, is, is working on a fabulous project on the Spanish flu and the impact of the flu. Right, the flu in 1918, 1919, we think killed 50,000 Canadians. That's almost as much as the First World War, but there's almost not a single monument in this country to those flu victims. So what is it about the war? 4,000 national monuments, overseas monuments. There's something about this war. There's something about the shock of it, the trauma. And I think, well, I talk about it in the book and why it reverberates over time and why we are haunted by this war, I think. This is our American Civil War, in a way that the Civil War haunts Americans to this day. It's a war that we take pride in. It's a war that we still shed a tear over. It's a war that changed us forever. Um, the introduction of income tax, enfranchisement for women, the division in our country, the stepping out onto the world stage. You can look at the ramifications of the First War, they're still with us today. But I don't think that's why it haunts us. I think it's the dead. I think it's a 65, 66,000 dead to a country of 8 million. Today's equivalent would be 330,000 dead. What would Canada be if we fought in a war where one third of all adult males enlisted, served, and we lost 330,000 killed, not to mention the equivalent would be about 900,000 physically wounded and countless more with mental wounds. I think that's the horror of it, but it's mixed up with pride, a country coming of age, and all of that. And that is why I think 100 years later, we still care in a way that we don't seem to care about many other history events. Right? What, what are the other events that we mark in this country? Canada, yeah, but it has nothing to do with what actually happened with Confederation. Um, there's something important about this, and I think it's something that continues to have a hold on us. Yes, Neil. Uh, Tim, that, that sort of leads into what I was going to ask you, about, which is, um, where are we going in the next hundred years with the living legend? And you mentioned in the, in the speech, you just alluded quickly to the Vinda Trap. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as where we go now after the 100th anniversary, uh, where do you think that's going to take us? Because we can't just leave Vinda at the 100. Yeah, no, we can't. Although we have done that in the past, so we may do that again. Um, where are we going? I'm a historian. I'm more comfortable looking backwards than looking forwards. <laughs> but I'll give it a shot. We lost our last veteran in 2010, John Babcock, 109 years old, the last of the 620,000 or so Canadians who served. And I remember thinking at the time, is that it? Is, is once you lose that last living connection, is it gone? And it hasn't, obviously. It's still with us in many ways. And I think it is with us, and I would say most powerfully, through the descendants through the millions of Canadians who had a grandfather or a great-grandfather or great-grandmother who served. When I talk across this country, it's amazing how many people have somebody who is a link to the war. And to them, it matters in a very intimate and powerful way, I think. And I would also suggest it's teachers like you, Neil, who inspired young students to understand their own local history and how the local history connects to the national story. That monument, sir, that you mentioned with the names on it, they're across this country. The digitization of the First World War attestation records now allows students to find the names on the monument, to see the attestation files at the National Archives website, and to find out who they were. That's a powerful link of the personal to the local, which links up to the national, which is a part of the international. This is a complex response, but I think those are some of the ingredients that move and continue to move us uh, in wanting to know about this war. Yes? Well, would you not say there are two components uh, here? One is that so many people from families died and are not where someone can 
celebrate or remember them here. And so that draws us to where they lay. Mm -hmm. And particularly now with DNA testing, there's a lot of work going on to find those people and be able to identify them as much as possible. And the second thing is, I think the Spanish flu, at least people were here when they died, but the impact, and it was men and women who went, almost 10% of Canada went in the First World War. That impacted the growth of our country tremendously. Yeah. We lost between three, four, even five generations, if you want to look at the span for us to grow as a country. And so the impact that has been left on families and communities is so intense when you think about other countries and what's happened to them. For, you know, compared to our population in such a large land mass. So do you not think that's another No, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. I think that those are part of the ingredients, without a doubt. It's not just the dead, it's all those guys who came back. Came back and helped build up our country. Some who came back damaged in body and in spirit. Um, others who came back and were good dads and built up the country. And that's that's the story, too, of the war. It's, it's complex. It goes beyond a battle. Um, there's no doubt about that. But what I find interesting is that the battle is a stand-in for a lot of that. And I think uh, all of those things, the need to go there, it's not easy to get to. Um, the fact that we bled for it and that we left Canadians behind there. Those are just some of the factors that compel us to keep going back to those battlefields, to go back to the ridge, to go back to the Western Front, um, in a pilgrimage of sorts that we continue to do 101 years later from the battle. Thanks very much, everyone. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.